Well, good morning. Welcome. I want to welcome those of you online that are watching today. And uh, it's kind of a different feeling in here today, isn't it? Just by taking the pews out, you know, you change up the circumstances a little bit and things feel a little different today, don't they? So, but uh, it's good, I think, sometimes to change things up. And uh, we'll see what we can do about that after we get everything fixed up. How do we change it up later on? But uh, again, uh, welcome, and uh, it's an exciting time of year. Just a couple quick announcements. First of all, uh, many of you know uh, Dave uh, and Linda Larson. Uh, they are off in uh, Israel right now touring the Holy Land, and um, Linda slipped going down uh, to see, uh, I believe it was the tomb of Jesus or something along those lines. But anyway, she slipped and fell, hurt herself. So she did receive prayer over there um, for her injury to her head. She was having headaches, and so uh, she's doing better, but they requested prayer. So let's just take a moment right now and pray for, for her and for her well-being on her uh, trip. Holy Father, we thank you so much for your goodness, and we thank you so much for the blessing it is to Dave and Linda to be over there in Israel and, and seeing the places where your son walked when he was on this earth. And God, it is just a wonderful time and a wonderful trip for them. But you also know what happened to Linda. You know exactly what she's experienced and, and the aches and the pains that she's having in her body. And Father, you just know, uh, Father, what's going on. And, and we hear of our sister over there hurting. And Father, we are seeking you, you, O oh God of mercy, for your relief and for your comfort. It is such a privilege that we can come to you with every burden, with every care, with every concern. And Father, we come to you with a hope that you are our God who delivers, who heals, who restores, and that we have all faith in you, God, in your perfect will. You know every situation better than we do. You know exactly what can be worked through all the situation. And we know that you know how to glorify your son in our midst. And so we praise you, we thank you, we honor you, and we just ask you now to heal our sister, make her body completely well and strong, that your son would be glorified. In his name we come to you and pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, just a couple things. So as uh, Bill was mentioning in the announcements, we're going to have a service here uh, 12 days from now. We'll be taking the Lord's Supper together where we gather together to um, come and partake of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And in so doing, we also do a foot washing. So if you've never done that before and have any questions, please feel free to ask us about it. But ultimately, what we're doing, and if you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 in preparation for that night, it talks about coming before the Lord in a, in a worthy manner. It says, let everyone examine themselves. And part of the examination process of coming before the Lord on that night is to humble ourselves before God, to realize where we stand, but also to realize where he stands as our Savior, as our justifier. And it says that we proclaim the Lord's death by so taking of that Lord's Supper together. And so that's what we're gonna be doing. And part of that is as he did in the night in which he was betrayed and which he was crucified, he washed his disciples' feet. And so there is a humility in being able to wash our brother's feet and there's a humility in being able to allow somebody to wash one another's feet. And so we, before taking the bread and wine, will humble ourselves before each other as a body of believers looking to care for one another. And so again, if you would read 1 Corinthians 11, uh, se verse 17 through the end of the chapter, it actually talked about a schism that was going on in the body because some people were not waiting for others. They, there wasn't care for the flock. And he said, basically, don't you realize what you're doing? If you're not caring for the flock, you're not really taking the Lord's Supper. And so the heart that we come with is not just what the sacrifice means to me, it's what the sacrifice means to us as part of the body of Jesus Christ. And so we will take the time to have care for one another, uh, to come reflecting on the Lord's work and what he said as an example in that night in which he was betrayed, when he thought about the fact that that was going to be it for him in his physical life, he was thinking of his disciples, which was such a beautiful thing. And so we as well will come with that heart and that mindset, uh, thinking about Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, and uh, taking care of one another uh, in that service. So, uh, if you, again, if you have any questions, please let me know. Now, that is on a Thursday evening, the 21st. On Wednesday, the 20th, 
If you would like to come to this church to pray, I will be here uh, all day on Wednesday. I'll plan to be here from about uh, uh, 8 in the morning till about 9 p.m. that night. Um, and I will be here just praying, worshiping God. I'll probably be on that piano a little bit, and we'll just be singing praises. So if nobody shows, no problem. But if you want to come pray for 30 minutes, an hour, whatever, please feel free. The church will be open all that day. We can't do that because we have construction. I'm going to be in that side <laughs> in the fellowship hall, but I'll bring my guitar, and we won't have a piano. So I will, we will have something here then on that day on that side. So thank you, Stephanie. See, that's why I got married. I was just telling Scott yesterday, I need my wife because what would happen to me if I didn't? So uh, wonderful things. So again, if you have any questions about that, uh, please let us know. And then also, uh, Bill also mentioned in the announcements, there is a, a seminar on the feast days. If you don't know anything about God's feasts that are in the Bible and want to learn what they are all about, what they mean, that'll take place at 145 in classroom 5. So if you go straight across from uh, the church here into the fellowship hall, go all the way to the back and to the left. So the basically far east north corner of that building, that's the classroom number 5. Yes? The Bible study room? Do you have Bible study in that room? See, that's why I need Carolyn too, because <laughs> I don't know what goes on in these places. So what we'll do, you're going to do the library? Thank you. All right, so we will, we will be there, classroom number five, because it has the big whiteboard. It'll make it easier for us. So, and, and there'll be an opportunity both to learn and then to ask questions uh, as we talk about God's feast days. So uh, we're coming to a time uh, in the season that we are celebrating uh, as we talk about the Lord's Supper, why do we do it at this timing? It's because of the things that God had written in the scriptures in regard to the timing of Jesus' death, which happened on Passover. It was at the beginning of Passover, the beginning of the 14th day that he gathered with his disciples, that night in which he was betrayed, and all through the day he goes through the processes we can read about in scriptures of how he was betrayed, uh, how he was taken, how he was tried, how he was falsely accused, he was beaten, he was mocked, he was scourged, and he came to his death on the cross on that very day. And he was taken down, as it says, before the, uh, the Sabbath that was coming, which was the first day of unleavened bread, a holy day. So he died on the Passover, and then the Feast of Passover, which is known as the Feast of Unleavened Bread, began. Now, some of this might sound shocking to you. I remember the first time somebody started talking to me about a Feast of Unleavened Bread, it just sounded like, what in the world are you talking about? I never heard of that. And as a teenager, when I heard about this Feast of Unleavened Bread, no one had ever taught me that in a church before. Nobody had ever gone through it. But you realize there's a lot of scriptures about the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Passover and what a wonderful time of revival it is throughout scriptures when the people of God were looking back to God, to turn to God, as in the time of Josiah who commanded that a Passover be celebrated or Hezekiah, or we look at Joshua entering the Promised Land and seeing that they were celebrating Passover and Unleavened Bread. And of course, the greatest fulfillment we have, Jesus Christ. So the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7 and 8 says, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Not with the old leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And so what we see in the feast of God is this beautiful picture and plan how God is going about to remove the curse that began when mankind sinned in the garden and to take it from, to a place where there will be no more curse. There will only be blessing, the blessing of God in our lives. And all of this begins with Passover and Jesus Christ slain from the foundation of the world. And so we will be taking the Passover. If you turn with me to Isaiah chapter 53, Notice with me here in Isaiah chapter 53. There's a prophecy here in regard to the death of the Savior, the Messiah, who was promised to come. And what I want us to focus on here today is I want us to consider Jesus, the sacrifice, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world, and what he did for us. 
And Father, as we begin to look into your word, I just pray that you would open our eyes to see, our hearts and minds to understand the things that you have accomplished through your son Jesus, and that we may see his perfect sacrifice and the perfection of everything that you have done through him, that we may receive and that we may believe in him who is the way, the truth, and the life. It is he who ushered us into a relationship with you, Holy Father. And Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for that. We pray in your name. Amen. Isaiah 53 says, Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow before him as a tender plant, as a root out of the dry ground. He has no form or comeliness that when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Now, this is a prophecy of our, of our Lord Jesus. Notice this. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You see, sometimes when we look at things that happen in life and we look at what was going on in the life of Jesus, it would be easy to consider him smitten by God, stricken, afflicted, maybe even the flesh not winning, so to speak. But what he was doing in the sense of everything that God had purposed was to have laid on himself all the sins and the Father to lay upon him all of our sins, that he would be stricken, that he would, who knew no sin would become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. Now, if any of you need a Bible, I wanted to mention I forgot, there are Bibles up here if you need it. And just raise your hand if you need a Bible, we'll get you one. We usually keep them in the seats in front. But let's continue on here in Isaiah 53, verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. It's a hard thing for us to do humanly, isn't it? He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Do you remember when they were questioning him? Who are you? Tell us who you are. And it said he just kept silent. And they would hit him, and they would spit on him, and they would mock him. But he was silent. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. Because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It pleased the Lord to bruise him and has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the soul, uh, spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and he made intercession for the transgressors. So here is what we can know in, in, in part of what Jesus is going through in the sacrifice, and the sacrifice that we talk about, and what he gave when his life was taken, that life that he laid down. But what was going on was the Lord was putting on him, applying upon the Son of Righteousness every sin that we had. Now, this sacrifice is an amazing thing. We talked last week, uh, or two weeks ago, I can't remember now, in, re in regard to the blood of Jesus. And the application, when they put the blood on the doorpost, how that faith 
made all the difference. It didn't matter what was really going on in your house. When you believed and applied the blood of the lamb to the doorpost, you were protected. But what I want us to do is think about the lamb today in terms of what was the lamb thinking as all this is going on. You know, we can think about what it was when they would take the little lamb on the 10th day and bring it into the house and make it a pet and take care of it. And when they took its life, maybe there was fear there, maybe there was trepidation. I don't know what it looked like. I haven't personally done it. But we can know what was on Jesus' mind, at least in part, when we consider the things that he was saying as he was going on that cross and being crucified that day. And I'd like to spend the rest of our time thinking about that today and the message that he gives. Let's turn over to Luke chapter 23. We're going to look today at the seven sayings from the cross. And yes, and if anybody needs a Bible, please feel free to raise your hand. So we're going to, we're going to look at several scriptures today. But Luke 23, verse 34. We're going to actually begin in verse 32 here. Luke 23, verse 32. There were also two other criminals led with him to be put to death. So we just read in Isaiah 53 that in his death it was with sinners, right? But, but the rich in, in where he was buried. But he was put to death with sinners. And so as it was prophesied, there were also two other criminals led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary... There they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Now when we look at these sayings of Jesus and we think about the crucifixion, I want you to think about the realities of that. This is our Lord who... When he was betrayed, he prophesied that all his disciples would flee him, and it says they all fled. Even Peter, who said, I would not forsake you. Even Peter, who was brave enough to be close when Jesus was being questioned and taken and judged, even Peter denied him three times, even having known the man, he said. This was one who was betrayed, and when they brought witnesses, the witnesses, they could not find any. But then they finally did, and people spoke falsely against him. They put coverings over his head, and they'd punch him and say, if you're a prophet, prophesy. Who punched you? Jesus could have answered right then, but he kept silent. He said he could have called 12 legions of angels. He knew the power that he had, and yet he surrendered to the will of his father. Even when he prayed in the garden before he was taken, he said, Father, with you all things are possible. And if it is possible, remove this cup, yet not my will, but yours be done. He learned obedience through the things he was going to suffer. And he was taken, and when they found nothing wrong, to appease the crowds, they had him scourged. Forty times he was hit with barbs and lashes. After being beaten with clubs, spit upon, mocked, it's even prophesied they pulled his beard out. That here, he would have been ripped apart. In fact, it was something that was not done to both be scourged and to be crucified. So our Lord was, was tremendously beaten. Would have been a chance he could have died even from what he suffered in his scourging. But here he is, now being taken out with criminals, put up onto a cross where the only thing that keeps you alive is your ability to strengthen yourself up. Because every breath that you take requires that you push up with your feet because you're hanging. You're hanging so that you will slowly lose your strength and suffocate. It's a torture risk death because you have to keep trying to lift up to, to grab a breath. But he's already been beaten. He's already been scourged. He's already in a form of weakness. 
And they nail him to that cross. And so with every portion of his body, he must have been writhing in pain. And the first thing he says, as they say, and they crucified him, he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. What kind of love is this? What kind of love is in this heart, this maturity, this perspective, that the very ones who are inflicting pain and harm on you, he's saying, Father, forgive them. They, they don't know what they do. See, we can't really think about the sacrifice of Christ and the pain of it without really understanding what is going on inside of our Lord Jesus as he is being crucified and he is looking not only to those who were before him, putting him on the cross, but all who have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Put a marker here in Luke 23, if you would. Let's turn back to Psalms. Psalms chapter 103. Psalms 103. Notice here in Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. It's the very character of God who forgives, who heals. Verse 4, who redeems your life from destruction. Praise be to God that we have such a God who loves us so much that rather than judgment coming on us, he would grant us the gift of grace through Jesus Christ that he would suffer in our place for our iniquities and our sins. Verse 4 again, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. You see, rather than coming in a spirit of condemnation to those who were hurting and afflicting, he was there in a spirit of mercy and of goodness to bring about justice, to make just those who had sinned. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame and remembers that we are dust. Forgive them, Father, they know not what they do. Turn back with me to, uh, or actually, you can hold your place here, but turn back to Luke, where you have your place held there in Luke 23. And so it says that they divided the garments in verse 34. The people stood looking on. Even the rulers with them sneered, saying, he saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. See, sometimes we think about that. How does that hit your pride and ego when you know that you can do something and that you willingly choose not to and they mock you for not doing it? Has anybody ever experienced something like that where you just have to basically say, I'm not going to let my ego get the best of me. I'm going to humble myself. He had full power to do what he wanted to do, but he did not. The soldiers also mocked him coming and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. So they put the inscription over him, he, this is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. 
And he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. So here is Jesus suffering, being mocked, being sneered at. And what is he doing? He's giving a promise of hope. You see, when we look at Psalm 103, when it talks about he will not strive with us, he will not punish us, when it talks about the blessings of life, for as, in verse 11, for as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. For as a pa- father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. He knows our frame, he remembers that we are but dust. He's telling us, remember who this God is, who not only loves us to save us, but he loves us to give us hope. We were made in the image of God, and everything he's doing is to make us in the image of God till we all come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, the purpose and work for him being on the cross and enduring the suffering is so that we would have life and hope. And so he's not thinking of himself in this moment. What is he saying? Hope. A promise of hope given to all who believe in him. Jeremiah 29 verse 11 says there that I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. That was exactly why Jesus was coming and what he wanted to see. Turn with me now to John chapter 19. John chapter 19, verse 26. John 19, verse 26. You can leave your place in uh, Luke. If you want, we'll come back there one more time, but you might want to mark a place in John. So I'm going to try to get you marking three or four spots today. John chapter 19, and notice this with me in John chapter 19 and verse 26. So when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. Woman, behold your son. So on the cross, we have Jesus making the family connection. It says in John chapter 1 and verse 12 that Jesus' coming was to give us the right or the authority or the power to be children of God. He was creating family by what he was doing on that cross. Turn with me over to Matthew chapter uh, 19. Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 29, it says, Everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. Jesus prophesied that there would be those that would hate. He said even that father would turn against son, right, and brother against brother, that even there might be divisions, but he also promised that when we come to him, that he's going to bring about family and restoration into our lives. So when you think of these things Jesus saying on the cross, already, what is his heart? Love to forgive, hope to give forth promise, and faithfulness that you will have family in his kingdom. These are the things that that are just at the core and the essence of everything that is about Jesus Christ. And as we reflect and proclaim his death, he died with cause. He died with reason. He died to glorify every one of us who believe on this earth that he is the way. And everything about who he is is demonstrated in the things that he was teaching us as he spoke from his cross and what 
what he said. Turn with me now over to uh, Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. And notice here in Matthew chapter 27, Notice what it says here in verse 40. Excuse me, let's start in verse 39. And those who passed by blasphemed him. This is Matthew, again, I'm sorry. Matthew 27, verse 39. Those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads, saying, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from that cross. Likewise, the chief priests also mocking with the scribes and the elders, Right? The religious elite, you could say, of his day. Those who had position and power. Those who were looked to by others. Saying, he saved others himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. So all those who caused him trouble throughout his life, they're causing him trouble while he's suffering. I want you to think about the power of this. We can't forget what Jesus is going through and as he hears these things. Verse 43, he trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. So his disciples who fled and didn't come back till later, as at least we see his mother and the apostle John before him on the cross. But what he's getting is the people coming the elders, the chief priests, the religious, the soldiers, they're there to mock him. And he says, if he will have him, for he said, I am the son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of those who stood there when they heard that said, this man is calling for Elijah. Verse 49, it says, let him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. He cried out with a loud voice, it says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I'd like us to turn to Psalm chapter 22. Because this word that Jesus spoke is a word that comes right from this psalm. And as much as this was a declaration of what Jesus was experiencing, what Jesus was feeling as he's on the cross, as much as he's feeling the abandonment of sin or of shame or of the mocking. It said that he endured the cross, despising the shame, it says in Hebrews 12, verse 1. He despised the shame. But he who is despising the shame, when he cries out to God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22, 1. Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? See, this prophecy was to tell us what the creator, the one through whom God made the heavens and earth, all things seen and unseen, who would empty himself of glory to take on the form of a man, to humble himself as a man, even to death, the death of the cross, crying out. We know exactly what he's crying here. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do we begin to th even closely, remotely understand what this is? That he who was in glory before the world began is being beaten, scourged, abused, and mocked by his own creation. Suffering in darkness and feeling the abandonment that makes our Lord the perfect mediator and the perfect high priest for every one of us. He knows exactly the depth of pain to feel the separation and expressing this as it's prophesied in Psalm 22. Verse 2, notice, 
Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear me. And in the night season, and am not silent, but you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and they were not ashamed. But I'm a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. Isn't that exactly what we read? And they shoot out the lips and they shake their heads saying, he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Exactly what was prophesied to happen is recorded as a witness to us in the Gospels. That this very thing they would do to him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Mocking him. Notice, but you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while on my mother's breasts. All from the very beginning, I was cast upon you from birth in my mother's womb. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. See, in this, there's an answer to his very prayer that, that he prayed to Almighty God. If it be possible, remove this cup. And God was giving him the answer and that moment and through all of that, the answer was, this is what you will go through, as he well knew. But let's not forget the pain and the feeling that Christ was going through when he cries out to his father. The abandonment that he suffered, that he could reconcile us to our father, that you and I would not feel that abandonment. Isn't it beautiful how the thing he had said before he cried this out was to acknowledge the potential abandonment of his own mother and making sure that she would be cared for not only by her family but even by one of his disciples and basically asking John to play the role of a son to take care of her. It says from that day, John took her into his house and she lived with him. He treated her like a mother. And so he, who was thinking of the abandonment and the reconciliation for every person to have a family, he himself was suffering from the abandonment on the cross. Turn with me now to um, John chapter 19. Okay. Yes, so Cal is pointing out that the comma there in uh, Luke 23, 43, more appropriately be after the word today. Thank you, Cal. So we're at John 19. John chapter 19. In verse 28, the next thing that was said on the cross, John 19, verse 28. So after this, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. I thirst. Back in Psalm 22, we're just where, notice in Psalm 22 and verse 14. As Jesus is saying, I'm thirsty, verse 14 of Psalm 22 says, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot's herd, and my tongue clings to my jaws. Again, exactly what was prophesied, that he would be so thirsty. But notice, you have brought me to the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me, the congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look 
and stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far from me. O my strength, hasten to help me. So the whole heart of Jesus Christ, when you think about him being poured out, every bit of his energy, every bit of his life, that as he talked about his tongue clinging to the dust. And isn't it amazing that earlier in John, when he was in this ministry and on the last day of the feast, in John 7, in John 7, verse 37, on the last day of that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And so at the very place of his cross and his death, where he is crying out for thirst, he's bringing it forth so we can all have a drink. That you and I would not need to thirst. That you and I would not have to experience this abandonment. That we would know that our God is with us, who saves us and spares us, and he bore all our iniquity and all our punishment and pain in his own body. Turn with me now over to John 19 again. John 19 and verse 30. John 19, verse 30. And so when Jesus had received the sour wine that they gave him, when he had said, I thirst, in verse 28, it's recorded in verse 30, it's, he cried out and said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. It is finished. You know, it's so incredible to think about the moment when he said that because there was a time when he was 12 years old that he was at the feast with his parents and they had left and they thought maybe he was with her, the uncle or someone else and, and he wasn't. And they went looking for him in the temple and he said, did you not know I'd be about my father's business? That he was born for a purpose and a plan. Turn with me back to John chapter 4. Because Jesus knew the purposes that he needed to accomplish when he came to earth. He knew the things that he needed to do. Notice in John 4 verse 34, Jesus said to them when they were wanting to give him food, he said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. And to finish his work. My will is to do the will of him who sent me. My food, what I eat. See, in all the life that Jesus is, is doing, he's basically saying, he was my drink, he was my food. And what he suffered as he's coming to the end of his life is so that you and I can be well fed and that you and I can have great drink and that you and I can have hope and promise of family and love and of eternal life. In everything that he is doing as he's speaking from this cross, he's speaking to us with such amazing love and such amazing hope and such amazing power of the very promises that you and I have at the foundation of our relationship with him, by which that we live, by which we exist, by which we move and have our being. Turn with me to John chapter 17, John chapter 17, John 17, Jesus, again, on the night in which he's betrayed, he knows what's going to happen, but here he is praying for his disciples. He lifts up his eyes to heaven. In John 17, 1, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you as you have given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. He knew that what the Father wanted him to do on the earth was completed. And he would now have that time. Every time before that they had tried to take him, to kill him, to take his life, God said, it's not your time. 
Jesus knew it wasn't his time. Not till the Father appointed would his life be laid down as a sacrifice. But he laid down his life, and here he is as he comes to this. He knows that the work that he has is to be finished. It is to be accomplished. He is going to put an end to sin in the sacrifice of himself. The last thing he came to do on this earth before he would be resurrected from the dead was to lay down his life. Let's turn over to Luke uh, again, 23, back to Luke 23 now. Luke 23, verse 46. When Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. You know, when we understand the scriptures, when we talk about Genesis and mankind being created from the dust of the ground, and he breathed into man the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And we think about him coming himself in the flesh into a jar of clay. The one, as it says in John 1, who, made, who God made all things through, everything seen and unseen. There was nothing made that wasn't made by him. And we think about him breathing out his last breath, and with everything of his being, laying down his life, and in his death saying, I commit my spirit to you. The beautiful words of trust, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When we think about these words and this life that God has given us, and we think about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and the wholeheartedness of who he was, and we look at this message, this message from the cross that he gives, the message of love, the message of hope and promise, the message of family, that he who knew no sin would be sin for us, that he who didn't know and feel abandonment would be abandoned for us, that he who did not know thirst was always satisfied, was poured out till he thirsted, that he who had always given food and help, that he was always doing this, that he was now being slain. The very hands that healed the people were now nailed to a cross. The very feet that carried the gospel from city to city throughout the region were nailed to the cross by the very people he came to serve and save. He was nailed to a cross. Friends, that is the power of sin when it is laid upon the Son, that the very one that he laid down his life, that that life would be given. And he was demonstrating that he alone could have the power to remove all sin from you and me. It stops at the cross. And in your life today, wherever you are in your life, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're experiencing, no matter what your past looks like, sin has to stop at the cross. This is the only place we go to, to the one that says, let it stop right here. Let me bear it for you. Let me wash it and cleanse you from all iniquity and transgression, from shame and guilt. And it is the thing that we proclaim till he comes, as it says in 1 Corinthians 11. We proclaim the Lord's death, that he's alive. He is our life in everything. Friends, when we celebrate the Passover, when we think about the sacrifice of Christ, when we come together as a congregation and we eat of the bread and the wine, to remember that this is what Jesus did and this is what his heart was for us. What part of this isn't perfect? What part of it isn't complete? What part of it isn't enough? I want us to think as we reflect. It says in 1 Corinthians 11. I'd like you to turn with me there. As 
as we think here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul said, verse 23, I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. For in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. I want you to notice that, as we've talked about here before, that before doing this, he gave thanks that he could make this sacrifice for us. He gave thanks that his body could be broken for you and me. He gave thanks that his blood would be shed for our salvation that through him would flow a river of life by which we could all be redeemed and saved from the curse of this world to the holiness and the blessing of God Almighty. And as he says this, he says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Verse 27, therefore whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats or drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another, but if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment, and the rest I will set in order when I come. So again, in verse 28, he says, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. I received a letter recently uh, from a person who had been looking at this verse and contemplating her life in the light of examining herself before the Lord. And she said that this time of year was a very depressing time for her. Because when she would examine herself, what she saw was the fault, the sin. The law of sin that dwells in our members, that is present with us where we go. This bag of lust, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life that wants to pull us down. And you know, when we look at sin and we see the glory of Jesus Christ. And when we see sin and how it is built not on love or on faith or on hope, but on selfishness, yes, we do feel down. But it says that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I've had people say that when they examine themselves, they do not find themselves worthy to eat of the bread and the wine. And I said, why would you feel that you're not worthy? And the answer is because I'm such a sinner. Because the things that I do in my life, they're not really that reflective of this sacrifice and of the ways of God. And to me, when you and I, through a matter of reflection upon who we are without God, in being honest, for he says, he who says he has no sin, what does it call him? A liar. But he who confesses his sin, God's faithful and just to forgive it. That it, the one who walks away from God, cleansed and justified, is not the one who thinks they're living a life apart from sin but the one who can be honest and say, I need you all the time. Forgive me and make me whole. And what makes us in a state of worthiness is actually when we do realize the absolute need we have for Jesus that is not of our own works or of our own righteousness, but what puts us in the right heart 
is when we come to that moment and maybe we do realize the depth of pain. Maybe we do experience the sorrow. Maybe we're like Josiah, who we talked about last week, who when he read the word of God, ripped his clothing and wept before the Lord because he realized how far he was away. And in that moment, when we come to God with all of that, do you realize that was why Jesus died for you? For that moment, for that time, and every time we come for the Lord Jesus to say, this is it. You're not far from me. You're so close. You're right here. Will you confess Jesus right now? When we come and we say, Father, forgive me. I have sinned. Father, forgive me what's in my heart. Father, forgive me for all the ways I go astray. That is where he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from unrighteousness. This is at the cross of Christ, and this is the fundamental foundation thing of life. We can never get away from this glorious gospel, for it is why we have life. That from Jesus Christ came a flow of life for you and me. Friends, if you are finding your sin, praise the Lord. If you are suffering and seeing hurt, praise the Lord. Because for this very thing, Jesus came and suffered for you and me. That he could wash away the sin. That he could cleanse us from the unrighteousness. That he could set us free on a new path. That we no longer walk around as slaves to that sin. But having been set free in his righteousness, we submit our members as instruments of righteousness to him. He's the one who makes us unleavened. He's the one that makes us sincere and true and clean. And friends, the good news has that as a foundation, and we never leave it. It's his sacrifice that's the foundation of every relationship we have. It's built on his sacrifice, and it is built on his forgiveness. So when you examine yourself... And so eat. Let us examine ourselves and let us celebrate that the most perfect, holy, just, and righteous one was willing to be made sin that you and I might become the righteousness of God. Would you withhold from Jesus the very prize for which he died? Would you want to steal away any of the joy of what he saw before him when he endured the cross and despised the shame? You have to accept his righteousness. That was the trade. That was the offering. That was the gift. Jesus says, give me all your sin, all your shame, all your guilt, all your hurt all your burden, all that weighs you down. And I will carry that. I will take it and I will remove it from you as far as east is from the west. And at the same time, he says, but as I take all your sin, you take all my righteousness. You receive complete acceptance you receive the very acceptance that I have. You receive the very standing before God that I have as a child of God. Who God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And we become holy and accepted in the beloved, in Christ, because we accept not only the removal of sin, we accept that he imputes perfect righteousness to us. Perfect. Friends, is there anything we can do to improve on the righteousness that Jesus gives us? We receive by faith. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord imputes no sin. Blessed is the man who receives his righteousness from the Lord God Almighty. Blessed is the man who by faith accepts the sacrifice for the washing of sin and for the giving and the receiving of righteousness. Friends, I, I, I beg of you that if you in any way 
are still suffering with shame in your life because of things that you have done in your past, of things that you're hurting on right now, if you're suffering from sin, whether a sin that you've committed or a sin that's been done to you, I'm asking you please to come forward. This whole front row is open. I'm asking you to come forward. and Please allow me to pray for you. Please allow me to minister to you in the spirit and to pray for the spirit of God to come on your life and in your heart and open you up to know the beauty of the Lord Jesus. This is the reality of life. This is why we are here. This is why we're a church. This is why we celebrate. Why put on facades? Why play the games? Why not be honest and just say, I need you, God. Because the one who came before him saying, I need you, that was the one who walked away in prayer being justified. That was the one who walked away. Friends, if you can honestly say you're perfectly healthy, stay where you are. But if you're not, come and receive. Come and receive from God the blessing that comes from his spirit. This is the gospel. This is the good news that's given to you. Have the courage that the Lord had who made himself sin that we might become the righteousness of God. Playing church, playing I'm perfect, playing religious games is not what we do at Rock Valley. Sin hurts. Sin causes damage. And the Lord said, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. And that's what we do here. There's no facade other than something false. The truth is to open our hearts that we would be intimate with God and with one another. Everything about these feasts is about intimacy. Everything about these feasts is about God opening up his whole self you could say, to be hurt. Because whether you accept him or not, he is completely open to receive you and is available and is offering to you even right now. The Lord God Almighty wants this church to be purified for him not just this group, but wherever his church is around this world. And this is the season of proclaiming his death till he comes. And so I'm asking you to come forward. I'm asking you to seek it out. And I'm asking you who are in a state of righteousness and have this confidence that you pray for every person that you can see in this room that is asking for help. And those that you need, and excuse me, those that you know that need him, that would be done. So I'm gonna start praying. I would ask the worship team to come up and we're gonna worship God and we're gonna close out this service. As they do that, let us just pray. Come on up. Holy Father, God in heaven, we thank you so much for the perfect sacrifice of your son. I thank you so much for the blessing of life. I thank you so much for the promises of hope and renewal and restoration. And God, I pray that in this room, God, we would just leave it all before you now. That every sin, that everything that is hurting us and that all the ways in which our hearts feel wounded or burdened, where we find there is anger and resentment, that you would cause us to see, God, every sin in our lives. That there would be no more judgment, but rather it would be replaced by a love for one another. That we would not speak evil of one another. That you would remove the hearts and the spirits of division. And that you would bring about a reconciliation that comes by not looking for how we will be served, but rather, God, to be like you and in all things serve one another in a spirit of love and of holiness and of goodness. God, I pray that you would bless us the humility to be able to confess our sins, and I pray that you would bless us with the humility to receive from you the righteousness that you promise. 
We believe, God. And please help our unbelief that in every way we may completely receive and accept and live by this promise, this gospel of grace that you have so generously given to us. May your name be praised. May your life fill us. In Jesus' name, let's praise him.